23rd, 2017 meeting of the Oshkosh Common Council. Welcome to everyone joining us in council chambers, as well as those watching or listening through Oshkosh Media. We are pleased to have citizens participate in the local government, so welcome to all. Will the city clerk please take the roll? Peck. Here. Paul Mary. Here. Allison Osby. Here. Herman. Here. Pansky. Here. Crozy. Here. Cummings. Here. Present, seven. Now please stand for the invocation, which will be led by Councilman Peck, and then the Pledge of Allegiance. We are mindful of the blessings of liberty that we have in this nation. May our decisions tonight improve the quality of life in our city and for our residents. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank our students for their help with the Pledge of Allegiance. We kind of stand over here and face that corner. See the man with the camera? Look at him. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to ask you your name, your age, where you go to school, and it's, since it's almost summer, what are your plans for the summer after school? Uh, my name is Reese Mazaris. I'm in eighth grade, and I go to South Park Middle School, and I'm looking forward to going to Florida in August. Okay, Florida in August, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a certificate for you for your help, and what is your name? My name is Samantha Schultz, and I go to Lakeside, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with my friends. Okay, it sounds like a fun summer. This is for you. We do all thank our students for their help in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> now, you're free to go home and study, or you can stay and watch local government operate. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you again, Mom and Dad. We have some introductions tonight for some new city, uh, some city staff members. So, with Chief Franz, uh, please step forward with your your personnel. Chief will be leading them up, but I will do the introductions. Oh, okay. I'm going to kind of I'm going to go in reverse order from the agenda because one doesn't happen without the other. And uh, first, I want to introduce uh, John Zemer. John's our new assistant chief. Uh, he replaces Jeff Shettle, who retired earlier this month. John's been with the department since March of 1990. And it says here he served in every rank in the department, including two years as a lieutenant instructor. So he's, uh, he's uh, made his way through the department. Uh, in, two th in 2013, John was promoted to, promoted to the battalion chief and was in charge of the prevention division. And following year, he was in special operations. And that includes our, our hazmat team, our technical rescue, and our dive teams. I don't know, if John, if you did any diving yourself, but um, you never... Okay, just, yeah, okay. <laughs> a little better than what I took, maybe a hotel or something, so good. Uh, and uh, as well as airport operations. And John has an associate's degree in fire science from Milwaukee Area Technical College, is a certified fire officer, paramedic, instructor, and serves on our adjunct faculty at Fox Valley Technical College. Uh, he's also completed the University of Wisconsin uh, Chief Officer Program uh, that was developed in conjunction with our State Fire Chiefs Association. So John's our new assistant chief. He had previously, as I mentioned, been a battalion chief, which then brings us to our next guest here, and that's uh, Battalion Chief Tim Hyman. Uh, Tim's with our, with, been with our department since uh, April of 07. You can look at these guys and smile, Tim. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't, we don't uh, this isn't the Inquisition. They're really a nice group of people. Uh, that's crazy. You see, he smiles very well. Yeah. He did that very well at the interview, by the way. Um, but uh, John's been a firefighter paramedic with the uh, city of Kenosha for five years previous to joining us. So 10 years with us and, and five years with Kenosha. He's been working as a lieutenant in the prevention division for the past two years, and he's a certified fire inspector. Uh, Tim has a bachelor of science degree in criminal justice with a sociology major and an associate's degree in fire science from Milwaukee Area Technical College. Uh, Tim recently completed the, completed the uh, Executive Fire Officer Program at the National Fire Academy, which is a very prestigious program. So congratulations on that as well, Tim. Uh, Executive Fire Program's flagship leadership course at our National Fire Academy, that is not an easy program to go through. 
Uh, Tim's a certified fire instructor and serves as assistant chief training officer with the town of Algoma, and he's also an instructor at Fox Valley Technical College as well. Great additions to uh, moving up in our management team, even though they've been with us for a while. Um, thought it was appropriate to introduce them, so you, you, you put the face with the, with the new title and position. So John and Tim, thanks, and welcome aboard. Congratulations. On our agenda is the annual Acanthus Historic Preservation Awards. This is something we do annually and hear from the Landmarks Commission mm -hmm. is Shirley Maddox, Paul Arnold, and Harold Buchholz, who will make the pres help me make the presentations. Shirley? Good evening. It's with pleasure that we have two, that I, I'm um, putting forward two nominees for the Acanthus Award for 2017. The first one is um, for a structure at 310 Wagu Avenue, built in 1884. The City of Landmarks, Oshkosh Landmarks Commission, recognizes Jeremy and Lori Hartzog for the historically appropriate exterior maintenance of their 1884 Queen Anne style home designed by William Waters. Their efforts included repair and painting of the woodwork of this historic home. By so doing, they also saved most of the original old growth wood of clapboard and cedar shingles that make up this house's exterior. They have protected Oshkosh's history and cultural resources and have prevented valuable timber going to the landfill. The Queen Anne style house at 87, then, now it's 310 Wagu Street, was designed by local architect William Waters and built by John Service in 1884 for $2,000. It was built for Oscar F. Crary, his wife Jane, and their three children. It was fitted with the latest comforts of the time. According to the Oshkosh Weekly Northwestern, December 11, 1884, quote, this building is another of the many Queen Anne style of house put up in this city recently. And like others of this style is a very pretty house of two stories furnished with a good cellar. On the ground, the building is of good size and has the appearance of a roomy, comfortable dwelling. It is fitted with a furnace and arranged so that hot and cold water can be obtained in all parts of the house. The front of the building is furnished with a commodious hall provided with handsome stained glass windows and a very fine oak stairway in harmony with the natural woods used in construction of the interior woodwork. Oscar Crary served in the Civil War Sergeant Company E, 2nd Wisconsin Infantry Regiment. He was engaged in the grocery trade for a number of years. Elected police of chief, or chief of police, in 1885, served as an alderman, and was appointed to the U.S. Pension Office in Milwaukee. The Crary family is buried in Riverside Cemetery. In 1893, Magdalene, widow of Matthias Kramer and four of her six children moved into 87 Wagu Street. She and her husband had come from Germany and settled in Oshkosh in 1852. This family was also in the grocery business, although their only son, George Washington, was a superintendent and Ida a bookkeeper for Oshkosh, Oshkosh Clothing Company, later Oshkosh Bagosh. By 1912, they were again running the family grocery store at 176 Wagu Street. The Kramer family lived in this home for 61 years throughout their adult lives. Emma, nay Kramer, widow of Herman Dirksen of the cigar business, resided here until her death, 
of 1954. From 1954 to 1990, there were 12 different families that lived at 310 Wagu Avenue, including Jay Tack, an Oshkosh teacher, and his wife, Mary, who lived here from 1975 to 1983, and Donald Barth and Carla S. Perry, professor at UW Oshkosh, who resided here from 1990 to 2001. The improvements that Jeremy and Lori Hartsock made to their historic home have raised awareness of the beauty of Oshkosh's early architecture in our central city. The restoration and paint palette draw attention to the architectural details, including the whimsical sunburst in the front gable. The Herzog's enthusiasm for their William Waters home and their commitment to restoring and saving the original architectural features has contributed to revitalizing this Victorian gem in one of the early neighborhoods in Oshkosh. Preserving our older and historic buildings is an essential means by which a community can achieve greater sustainability. Conserving buildings encourages the revitalization of our existing communities and has also been proven to be a powerful economic tool. The Landmarks Commission congratulates the Jeremy and Lori Herzog. <clears throat> Congratulations. Shirley, would you like to join me in presenting the certificate? Is there anything you'd like to say? Now, I, I go down your street almost daily, and I admire the work that you two did. They did this on their own. And it's, it's an amazingly large house, so. And you're still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to do it without our family and uh, each other and, uh, and God, because it was a one-year process from purchase in October to the end of that last fall, so awesome job that we got done, so thank you. And it's still in the works. We're still, <laughs> like the, we're gonna be redoing the, the porch railings and, and all of that, so it's still coming. <laughs> it's not done yet. And you're still smiling, that's the most important. <laughs> if you haven't had a chance, it is, they've done a beautiful job on this home that uh, stood for a number of years just standing there and nothing happening to it, so thank you again. award is rather a dramatic one. Um, the entire city knew about this and I think people across the state and maybe different parts of the country saw this project. This Acanthus Award is for the devote house and moving movers for the relocation of the Lewis Schreiber House at 1428 Algoma Street the Landmarks Commission is pleased to recognize the contribution of devote house and building movers for setting a precedent in historic preservation by taking ownership, lifting and transporting, and preserving from demolition a William Waters designed residence and ensuring its continued presence in the Oshkosh community. William Waters drew plans in December 1911 to erect a house on Upper Algoma Street for Lewis Schreiber. The Oshkosh Daily Northwestern, February 1st, 1912, notes, quote, ground will be broken as early in the spring as possible for the erection of a new residence for Mr. and Mrs. Schreiber. The house will be built on land which adjoins the residence of prop and property of E. W. Payne. A number of park-like trees add to the beauty of the location. The house is to be built of red bricks 
along colonial lines. Work will be pushed through the summer in the effort to have the house ready for occupation by September 1st. The estimated cost of the residence is not given out. William Waters' original blueprints for the Schreiber House are archived at the Oshkosh Public Museum. The Schreiber House is built of solid masonry instead of wood frame and brick veneer, as most houses are built today. The steep roof has parapet walls. Dental moldings below the roof are repeated on the front entryway. The Wisconsin Historical Society notes, this is a fine example of the Georgian revival in Oshkosh. The building is constructed of red brick. The entrance is centrally positioned on the long axis and marked by side lights and a pavimented porch. A tripart window is located above the entrance on the second floor. Further emphasis is placed on the entrance by the differentiation of dormers. The central dormer features a segmental pediment, and those on either side are triangular pediments. Louis Schreiber, his wife Floretta, and their children lived here until 1931. Louis Schreiber began his long association of 56 years with the First National Bank starting in 1896 as a messenger and working in every department until he became the bank's fourth president in 1924, succeeding Edgar Sawyer. He served the United States government in the sale of war bonds and savings bonds and was a founding member of the Oshkosh Foundation. An editorial remarked that, quote, he left a mark of distinction that will long serve as an example of lofty citizenship and public service. When Mr. E. W. Payne finally built his much larger mansion next door, the Schreibers moved to Shadow Lawn. Henry D. Meyer and his wife Hazel bought this house in 1932 and lived here for 50 years. Harry was secretary, vice president, president from 1939 to 1963, and chairman of the board of C.R. Meyer and Sons, a company that built many of the signature historic buildings in Oshkosh and continues building throughout the Midwest. He and his brother Edward saw the business succeed through the Great Depression. He was passionate about heavy industrial work and was the first to use a structural engineer. Although Harry died in 1874, his wife Hazel resided here in the home until her death in 1982. John Kelly, attorney, and his wife Teresa bought the house in 1983 and lived there until the Payne Garden and Art Center purchased the home in 2011 to avoid disputes about noise from outdoor events. Three families shared a century of living in this glorious home, also a contributing structure in the Algoma Boulevard Historic District, which is on the State and National Register. The State, uh, the Payne Art Center met with the Landmarks Commission in June 2011, proposing to build a parking lot on the site of the Schreiber House. The Commission proposed other options for a parking space and made it clear that if the house were moved, it should be preferably in a historic district with an appropriate setting. They offered to serve as a resource. The house was offered for sale for $1 to a buyer that had the means to move it to another location. When no buyer was found for several years, the pain advertised nationally. The most logical source to come and move and rescue and buy this house was the DeVote family. They own DeVote House and Building Movers and have been moving houses for over 50 years. Many Oshkosh residents remember this family moving a similar house across Lake Winnebago to Menasha in 1984. Preparations for the move including, included procuring a lot one block north on Algoma Boulevard and across the street, 
excavating the present lot so the movers could cut holes and place steel beams underneath the house to support it and then prepare the new lot. 30 jacks were placed under the house and a JSGS unified hydraulic jacking machine, a piece of equipment built for this job, to apply pressure on the jacks that lifted the house off its foundation and six feet up in the air. Every step was carefully measured. Placing 112 wheels under the house enabled them to roll the house off the foundation, traveling about one foot per minute. DeVote used remote control technology, setting different degrees and angles to direct the wheels. This was the first time such technology was used in Wisconsin. Citizens had watched the progress for months, and finally the move came on Saturday morning, May 27, May 27, 2016. The move of a house weighing 400 to tons, including the steel, was covered on all type of media, enabling those who could not attend to watch from afar. The tall, majestic house proudly moved up Algoma Boulevard and now sits comfortably at its new site. May it serve another family as it did the three families before for a century. It stands as a tribute to the architect, William Waters, the builders and craftsmen who used quality materials not to be found today, and to those who cared for this house. The Landmarks Commission salutes the Devote family for helping to preserve an outstanding historic structure that stood at a beautiful intersection of Oshkosh for over 100 years. Their expertise and confidence give hope to those who want to preserve rather than tear down the riches of our history. They helped the devotes help teach us a lesson about respecting what is beautiful, historical, and irreplaceable. The Landmarks Commission is grateful to the devote family and for their contribution to preserving another piece of Oshkosh history. Congratulations. Thank you, Shirley. And I see members of the Devote family here, so if you'd like to come forward, we have a certificate for you. Uh, about a year ago, you began this, well, more than a year ago. Jeremy, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to say a few words. I just want to say that this could not have happened without the, the countless efforts of Aaron Shear from the pain. Aaron worked countless. Uh, he tried to get this thing done, and and when I first met with him, we did not have a solution, but we worked through a solution together, and it could not have happened without Aaron. And I cannot say enough about the city and the state of Wisconsin. Uh, there was no roadblocks along the way. Everybody just had a positive attitude to get this thing moved. They believed in what we could do, and we were very happy to save this structure. Thank you, Jeremy. Next on the agenda is license status updates. There are two. First is Packers Pub at 1603 West 20th Avenue, and the other is Robbins at 1810 Omro Road. And I believe the city clerk is looking for direction from the council. It's either um, renew or revocate, correct? So w should we take this one at a time? Renew. <coughs> renew or not renew. Renew or not renew. <coughs> Uh, let's do the first, which is Packers Pub at 1603 West 20th Avenue. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this? Hey, Pat Rudiner, Packers Pub. The status of uh, where we're at on uh, the program is uh, I have uh, several people interested in the purchase of. Uh, and lease of the building. And uh, right now, I exa exactly I'm talking. Uh, yesterday, I received a call from a group from Fond du Lac, and the contingency was uh, does it have a license? I guess I don't know. 
uh, depending on what you decide as board members, if uh, we can extend this and put something together, uh, having the property, uh, have it up for sale or lease with uh, several people that were interested. But the big deal that I run into was uh, the licensing. Do we have the licensing? So I guess where things stand right now, this is where I'm at. I'm wondering if uh, it will be extended to try to put a program together in my part. All right, question? Any questions, uh, Mr. Odinger? Um, this license was, orig was the, the facility was closed in August of 2015. And in May of 2016, it was approved for renewal for through June of 2017, June 30, 30 June 2017, based on your comments that you were marketing it, that you had several prospects, that you needed the liquor license to sell it. It has now been over a year since we talked about that. Um, At what point is some there there? It is you, I, I know you say you have an offer contingent upon the license, but that's what we were told back with the last. We worked with a party for uh, over six months, and they were going to take over, and then things changed, and they backed out. So then it uh, opened it back up to trying to find somebody else. But this spring, I had to. Uh, at least uh, three people that uh, called me, showed interest. Uh, matter of fact, yesterday, like I said, uh, I had a party, a group from uh, Fond du Lac. They're very interested in uh, putting something together here. So um, that's why I would like to extend the license, because the property becomes uh, harder to put out, because it always been a bar for going on 39 years. Uh, a license uh, for food and, and uh, uh, alcohol uh, is what made that corner, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it continues to uh, grow that way. You know, but again, it is not, not to harp on it, but this is the same story we heard a year ago, and nothing happened. Now, and I know there's no guarantees, but what assurances can you give us that to get back to that there is some there there that this will actually be a sale or lease will be completed is there a and when would that be to a, and, for and, about and, six months at least i mean uh the, the only way i can go directly through and say hey this is what we have um, the time it takes to uh, you to make up your mind is all contingent on uh, for the period of time that I can hold this license or lose it and make the other contacts out there from the interested individuals mm -hmm. and not knowing where this license really stood at this time. So, Mr. Gordon, I do have a question. The, the interested parties, is their interest primarily in continuing this as a bar? Um, actually, three of them are looking at food and beverage. Putting a, okay, but in but not corner. another uh, unrelated type of activity? Uh, no, no. Okay. no. So food, food and beverage is bar, bar and restaurant. Bar and restaurant combination. Those are the ones that I've been dealing with. Uh, that were interested in uh, property. Deb? Um, do you currently have, or is the level of discussions something in which you could obtain a letter of intent, perhaps? Uh, if there's a period of time being allowed here, I, I, I can go after that. Uh, what what period of time are you allowing or will you allow 
for well, if, putting this together. Uh, I mean, my, my personal opinion is, you know, I was hoping we'd see something as of today, um, you know, within two weeks. Well, the, the license is actually approved through June 30th of 2017, correct? So you currently have the license. So I don't know why you would not be reinforcing that in any potential sale or lease option. I mean, you have the license. If there is some activity within the next five weeks, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't go through that. But if the license is currently approved through June 30th. Mm -hmm. And when would we be taking action on renewing? We have renewals on this evening, and we will have them on the next two meetings in June. So that would be the 13th and the 27th? Correct. I, I would think that at a minimum, this letter of intent could be acquired tomorrow at the outset, at the, at the, the, the outside, no later than the 13th of June, a couple of weeks. If this party is truly interested, I'm sure that they would, understanding that the situation, that we have to make the decision whether to keep it or to revoke it, that, as Ms. Pansky indicated, the license is good through the 30th of June. And, you know, we've acted in good faith previously by extending the license even with the same story we're hearing tonight that I've got a party interested in it and I would think that it would be incumbent upon you to prove that there is indeed this interest and if this person this party is truly looking to move forward that they would be more than happy to provide a letter of intent I don't have a question for the city clerk if we wait till the June 27th, I think that's what it was, June uh, 27th meeting. We would then do a revocation hearing, so that would be a, even another couple weeks, correct? And sure. they could bring in proof that they are, that a sale might be imminent or close or whatever, and we could extend it then, right? We would need to do the non-renewal hearing on the June 27th meeting. Okay. Okay, so would and I, I would need a little bit of time to prepare that. Okay. Then I would. Okay. Yeah, I guess I concur with the other council members. You know, um, it's been inactive. Um, last council meeting, we had uh, another owner in, and he came with a, a uh, information showing how it was listed and being listed and everything. Who do you have it listed with? Who are you working with to try to? find a buyer are you doing it on your own or are you working with a realty company or I had it out uh, with a realtor company and then nothing happened for a while okay I pulled it off but I had I have signs up and I listed it myself okay so you have just to... locally you're just trying to sell locally you're not you're not putting it out there on any kind of uh, network of bars and restaurants for sale or anything no. like that no so it's just kind of it's out there yes yeah, I guess um, at least by then, I guess we would have to make a decision to move forward with the revocation hearing by the June June first council meeting in June to let you have time to put put it together and stuff like that. So, I guess I would everyone in agreement move I hold it until at least <coughs> June. Well, I would, and I would direct you to get this letter of intent and to you know to to get something more than just. And, and I take it your word, sir. But it would be nice to have something that, that really shows there is this interest out there. And to have that to counsel to actually, would, would that go to you, Ms. Eubrig? Yes, please. So it is get it to the <clears throat> city clerk no later than June 13th. Thank you. It should be sooner. Yes. Yeah. And what? It should. Yeah. We should have it before June 13th all right, when so we then, put the agenda together. All right, then by, uh, the June, let's time. say, June 6th, which gives you two weeks. Is that 
acceptable? Uh, yes, if there is a problem, I, I, I guess I could call and say if it's going to run a few more days. Correct? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, just communi communi communicate keep, with the city. Clerk. Yeah, keep, keep your communication. But we would, need, we would need it no later than the 9th of June to get it on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next is Robbins at 1810 Omro Road. There. Someone here to speak to that. Good evening. My name is Wally Wagner, and I own Robbins Restaurant, and I closed it last June 30th. I had applied for the license, of course, through the due process last spring, and um, uh, because of a personal illness, and I closed it June 30th, and I'm asking for renewal of the license. We have it listed with a real estate company since that time, since I closed. We, um, we had a, an offer to purchase from an individual last October as an investor, and he was buying the building and then leasing it to a restaurant group from Oak Creek, Wisconsin. The, the investor backed out, and the people in Oak Creek are still interested in doing that. We're in conversations uh, bi-weekly with them. Uh, <laughs> looks like I'm going to be a bank for a while. <laughs> if it does happen, their intentions are to put a lot of money into Robin's Restaurant. And uh, they do run a successful operation in Oak Creek. And uh, they're just getting financing together with that. And we, the real estate company brought to my attention a few days ago that they are possibly an interested buyer to make it available for lease. Uh, so that might come together with these people in Oak Creek. But the people in Oak Creek have to get together about $400,000 from what they want to do to Robbins to create their presence in Oshkosh. And that would be, um, it's, I would have to say it's more like a country western type of sports bar image type of place. Uh, with food, of course, they are, um, they have a very good reputation where they are with a lot of competition. They uh, smoke their own ribs and brisket and things like that. And that's what they would present to Oshkosh with live entertainment, uh, probably once a week also. But there's, uh, I went to, of course, to their business in Oak Creek, and I was very impressed the way they run their operation down there. Very good operators. They've been in business a while. They aren't new people in town that get into a business like the hospitality business and expect grandeur when it's actually a lot of work. So uh, I'm still confident that we're going to be able to work something out. Um, I don't know. I can't give you a letter of intent because uh, that happened last October, but again, they visited us, I don't know, probably four or five times since the first of the year with engineers and architects to get, uh, they wanted to be in business truthfully before Country USA this year, and it just didn't work out. So hopefully that uh, we can get something accomplished before fall. That's basically all I have to, uh, I wrote a letter uh, when I uh, applied for the liquor license of the of what was happening, I don't know if you received it mm -hmm. at all. So, yeah. questions? Was yes. there any other interest besides this group from Oak Creek? Well, there is a, a an investor in Appleton that's interested, but he would have to find a tenant, and that that was relayed to me earlier this week. Not oh, well, <coughs> last week, but we are only Tuesday. It was last Thursday, actually actually when I got that. And that's your intent is to sell the business and then Absolutely. whatever they do yeah, with it. I, I'm going to be 71. You know, maybe I'll have to reopen it again. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's actively being marketed, obviously. I think all of us have driven by Oshkosh Avenue and gone yeah. by Robbins and seen the sign. So I'm comfortable that it's being actively marketed and attempts are being made to find an owner. Um, I talked to a couple chamber representatives who kind of concur with what Mr. Wagner is saying, so I'm comfortable in renewing, moving the license forward for another year. Right. I failed to mention that I don't know, maybe are aware that I own properties east of Robbins. I think there's seven parcels, mm -hmm. and right now um, they're act, uh, I accepted an offer to purchase, and they're working on 
different things to construction of a hotel and other development in that property. So that should help spur some more interest mm -hmm. in, uh, in Robbins also, in that facility. It'll be a nice addition to an entrance into Oshkosh. I know if things are done. I'm, I'm good with, yep. with proceeding forward. I have to say I've, I've known you for a while and you've always been a man of your word. Right. So there's absolutely no reason for me to doubt. And, and I drive by there quite frequently. Yes. Um, on my way out to Highway 41, I've seen a lot of activity um, in the parking lot of people going in and out of the building. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're trying to move it, trust me. It's not a, <laughs> closing a building isn't just closing a building. The expenses are, are substantial, you know, with the taxes and, <clears throat> and insurance, which is not reasonable in a closed building. My water bill, if you can look, is over $400 a month without running a drop of water, you know, and, you know, and the utilities to keep the building warm in winter and mm -hmm. cool in summer so it doesn't deteriorate. So I am I'm very <clears throat> much motivated to get someone interested in there. And of course the liquor license to me is a very important piece to have a, a, amongst the other things you sell on a piece of property too because it has been a restaurant for so many years. I only owned it for 20 years but um, you know it adds value to the property and I hope you can understand that, that it's mm -hmm. very important to a property owner. That, that's what makes this decisions hard. Yes. Because we know how important it is oh, to yeah. try to sell a property that was in that line of work and right. mm -hmm. then you don't have that piece but at the same time, mm -hmm. you know. So. Okay, is there anything else? No. I Thank concur you. with my fellow council members. Do you have the direction you need? That you, you would like to proceed with the renewal? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, next on the agenda, we have a public hearing. Uh, this uh, requires three readings and then a vote. It is resolution 17-246, approve final resolution for special assessments, contract number 17-12, miscellaneous utility improvements. <clears throat> resolution 17-246, approve final resolution for special assessments, Contract number 17-12, miscellaneous utility improvements. Third and final reading, resolution 17-246. Approve final resolution for special assessments. Contract number 17-12, miscellaneous utility improvements. Is there anyone in the audience that like to speak to this resolution? I see no one coming forward. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Pat? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Herman? Aye. Pansky? Aye. Prosey? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Now we have citizen statements to council. Statements are limited to five minutes, must address items that are not listed on the council meeting agenda are limited to issues that have an impact on the City of Oshkosh and the Common Council may address at a future meeting and must not include endorsements of any candidates or other electioneering. Is there anyone from the public? Please step forward. And you'll need your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is David Zerby. I live at 1031 Washington Avenue. I've been there for 18 years. I'm a member of the administrative team of Aurora Healthcare. I'd very quickly like to cover four points tonight related to the concept of complete streets. So I'd like to make sure that you're all aware of complete streets. I'd like to share why I believe this is important. I'd like to pass out some information that I copied for you uh, to help you uh, how to learn more about complete streets. And I'd like to ask the council to set a time at a future meeting to deliberate and then enact a complete streets policy. 
Complete streets are streets for everyone. They are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. Complete streets make it easy to cross the street, walk to shops, and bicycle to work. I biked to work today after I dropped my car off the U-Haul garage to get a hitch put on it. My wife picked me up because it was raining <coughs> afterwards. <laughs> but I, I try to bike to work when I can, all the way across town. The benefits of complete streets, uh, I'm in healthcare, so I believe that they improve health. Uh, they help people to move about. Uh, they improve safety. Uh, bicycle, car interactions can be adversarial, and we want to reduce that. We want it to be safe for pedestrians uh, to cross. Uh, I was rear-ended uh, a year or so ago while waiting for a pedestrian to cross uh, down by city center, and the car coming up quickly behind me didn't think that I should have stopped, even though the crosswalk wasn't really visible to let those pedestrians cross. My wife and I missed the movie. <laughs> uh, I think it's equitable. This is good for children. This is good for the elderly and for those who are less mobile. It will help lower transportation costs. And some of the information that I will give you gives much more background on that. It's good for the environment, particularly trips less than a mile if we can walk or use a bicycle we're putting uh, less fossil fuel fumes into the air. It's proven through case studies, and I'm giving you information about Alexandria, Minnesota, a town of 14,000 where their bike path, like our Wyawash Trail, went by, and the sign in this, at the city junction of that trail said, no bicycles. <laughs> and they've really transformed people stopping at their shops. I'd like you to look at that YouTube video. It only takes about four minutes. So this can promote economic re revitalization and mostly create livable communities. So I have some handouts that I will give you, and this is my request. I'd like to see the city of Oshkosh adopt a complete street policy. Appleton, La Crosse, Madison and Milwaukee have already done so. I'm asking that each of you commit to learn more about this subject. And I'm asking you to dedicate time in your future meetings to deliberate and enact a complete street policy. That would guide your departments to consider these concepts whenever a street is being rebuilt. That's the, the in, in, impact of it. I believe this is crucial to the long-term vitality of our community and the health of our residents. I've enjoyed being here tonight, and I thank you very much for your service in our city government. This is there one question before I step down. There is a workshop at the university on June 13th. It's the, it's the evening of the 13th, which I 13th. just noticed you have a meeting that evening, as well as the June next the morning, the 14th. Mm -hmm. It's, that I workshop think, think is one of only seven offered all over, all over the country based on a federal grant. So if you're able, you could go the following morning because you can go either in the evening or the morning. There's a fact sheet in here about that workshop. That's uh, the East Central Wisconsin right. Planning Commission has put that on. And my understanding is that it's particularly designed for government officials. Correct. And could I just ask a follow-up question too? Um, so I have my definition of what complete streets um, are defined as. Would you just share for the public what your definition or what you're proposing as a complete street? Because not everybody's familiar with that. I, and I didn't really go into the description. I we only have, so I didn't describe, a, a, but I, I defined it, right? It's designed to enable self, the safe access for all users, including pedestrians, bicycles, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. Depending upon the width of the roadway and the amount of traffic, you'll see different things. You may see a single lane each direction with a turning lane in the middle with a bike path, maybe a, a, on one side or on both sides. 
you'll often see green space. So the idea of permeable surfaces, uh, trees and shrubs that, that help us with water uh, storm runoff are built into this. But some of the other things that you often see, instead of two skinny little crossbox, you may see the, what looks like big dominoes, the big white uh, things that make it as a motorist, you see the crosswalk much earlier than you might see a crosswalk as it now exists today. I, I, I like sushi, so I often go from Aurora over to Festival Foods and get my sushi, and it's an adventure crossing <laughs> West Haven Drive on foot, and I do it a lot. I really like sushi. Uh, this is not meant to be an ad for Festival Foods sushi. <laughs> Um, but the other things that occur are bump outs near the intersections. And one of the purposes of that is it causes the motorist to slow down. But equally important, it shortens the distance that the pedestrian is actually in the street. Mm -hmm. So these things are very significant. Not, I'm not just a bike crazy bike person. This is about people on foot and walking about. So a complete street is for everyone automobile, bicycle, and on foot. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor Herman looked it up, and I on the 13th it is from 3 to 5, and on the 14th it is? 8.30 to 2.30. And it's okay. at the, um, uh, it's going to be at the U UW Oshkosh Alumni Welcome Center. I'm sure Mr. Collins has information on it. Thank you. Yeah, there's a fact sheet in here about right. that. Right, and it's um, put on by the, um, uh, East Central Regional Planning Commission. I'm sure the Bicycle Pedestrian Committee has been looking at it. Oh, yes. I know the Parks Board has talked a little bit about it. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> now we move to consent agenda. The consent agenda items are those items of routine administrative nature that are voted on by the Council in a single roll call vote. Staff recommends approval of all items. Any member of the public or common council may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for discussion. Two, report of bills by finance director. Three, receipt and filing of common council minutes from April 11, 2017. Receipt and filing of museum board minutes from April 6, 2017. Resolution 17-247, approve initial resolution for set special assessments for storm sewer laterals at various locations with signed waivers. Resolution 17-248, approve acceptance of waivers for special assessment notice and hearings. Resolution 17-249, approve final resolution for special assessments for storm sewer laterals at various locations with signed waivers. Resolution 17-250, approve initial resolution for special assessments for storm sewer, storm sewer laterals, various locations. Resolution 17-251, approve amendment to engineering services agreement with McMahon Group for design and preparation of construction documents for the urban reconstruction of North Main Street in Perrins from New York Avenue to Murdoch Avenue $79,511. Resolution 17-252, approve agreement with NES Ecological Services for implementation of stormwater detention basin vegetation maintenance program, $116,156.48. Resolution 17-253, approve general development plan for new parking lot, 22 through 224 Viola Avenue and 227 West Linwood Avenue in Perrins, Oakland Elementary School, closed Perrins, Plan Commission recommends approval. And then Resolution 17-254 through Revolution 17-262 are all special events. I won't keep reading special event or the year 2017. The first is Re Resolution 17-254, Oshkosh Area School District, in parens, OASD, close parens, Community Learning Centers, to utilize Menominee Park for the Community Learning Centers of OASD end of year celebration event, June 1. Resolution 17-255, 
Cool Events LLC to hold the Bubble Run 5K on the Experimental Aircraft Association in parens EAA grounds June 3rd. Resolution 17-256, St. Jude the Apostle Parish to hold their parish picnic June 16 through 18. Resolution 17-257, Silver Star Brands to utilize Menominee Park for their team member appreciation day June 22nd. Resolution 17-258, Oshkosh Elks Lodge number 292 to utilize Rainbow Park for Oshkosh Elks Sheephead Fishing Tournament July 15. Resolution 17-259, Lords Academy to utilize city streets for the Lords Academy Eucharist procession, August 31. Resolution 17-260, UW Oshkosh Department of Residence Life to utilize city streets for the Resident Hall move-in days, September 2nd through 4. Resolution 17-261, Oak Brook Church to utilize Sword Creek Trail and city streets for the Babies for Heaven 5K Run Walk, October 14. And the final special event is Resolution 17-262, Oshkosh Town Down, Downtown Business Association bid to utilize city streets for the Downtown Bid Holiday Parade, November 16. Resolution 17-263, approve, approve block party Greg Lux to utilize Evans Street between Nevada Avenue and Custer Avenue to hold a neighborhood block party, August 12, 2017. Resolution 17-264, approve council member appointments to various boards and commissions. Resolution 17-265, approve appointments to boards and commissions. And the final resolution under the consent agenda is Resolution 17-266, approve special Class B licenses, operator and taxi cab licenses. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to any one of these items on the consent agenda? I see no one coming forward. I'll bring back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Uh, Mary. Yes, um, Kathy Snell. On resolution uh, 17259 for the Lord's Academy uh, Eucharistic procession, um, thank you, by the way, for including the maps with these applications. It makes it a lot easier to digest some of this. Just a quick question, and that is um, they have asked to close Witzel down um, at like 8 in the morning or 8.30 to um, cross Witzel. And I think that's a Thursday, if I recall looking that up. Um, is that pretty standard that, you know, during kind of morning drive time that we would close down a major street for something like this? It's not a, uh, it's not a full closure. Okay. It'll be just while they cross Whittle. Um, okay. They're not so going it's pretty up. quick. Yes. Okay. It'll be a short period of time. Their and then when they loop be, back around at 1030-ish. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Their All whole right. walk will be maybe 20 minutes to get from one to the other. So gotcha. just that little crossing of the street is, it's not a full closure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion? Apparently not. Would the city clerk please take the roll? Pack. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Allison Osby. Aye. Herman. Aye. Pansky. Aye. Rosie. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Carried seven. Uh, the first pending ordinance is Ordinance 17 267. Designate bicycle lanes and modify parking regulations to restrict parking on west side of West Haven Drive from 9th Avenue to Patriot Lane. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this or this ordinance? I see no one coming forward. Bring it back to council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Pack. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Allison Osby. Aye. Herman. Aye. Pansky. Aye. Krause. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Carried seven. Ordinance 17 268 approved zone change from RH 35 Rural Holding District to HI Heavy Industrial District for property located north of Atlas Avenue 
and east of Global Parkway Southwest Industrial Park Plan Commission recommends approval. Plan Commission approved. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this? I'll bring it back to council for a motion and a second. So moved. moved. Discussion? Second. Would you please take the roll? Pack? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Herman? Aye. Pansky? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. We have one new ordinance. There will be no formal action taken at this evening, and that is Ordinance 17 269, modify parking regulations on 17th Avenue. We'll move on to new resolutions. The first is Resolution 17-270, Approve Annual City Licenses in parents Renewals, close paren. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this? Bring it back to the council. Motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Pack? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Herman? Aye. Pansky? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Next we have resolution 17-271, approve tax increment district number 32 project plan, designate tax increment district number 32 boundaries, create tax increment district number 32 granary redevelopment, and plan commission recommends approval, close parens. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this resolution? I see no one coming forward. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Davis, Mr. Burrish, I think. Um, couple of things um, I appreciate the press covering stories and that and and I know that they only have a certain amount of airtime and column space um, it's been discussed that this tiff is for a restaurant generally we don't do tiffs for restaurants and I know that the part that was left out of some of these quotes is, is that it was also there's an office development as part of this uh, Mr. Burrich or Mr. Davis, could you address the address this and kind of clear up exactly what this is and why the city is doing this, even though it is uh, in all of our documentation, but so that it that it is clearly reported of what is going on here. I can attempt to do that. Uh, this is a blight elimination project. Uh, that's one of the criteria used for creating a tax increment finance district. Uh, the granary uh, building has been vacant for over 10 years. Uh, it's falled into a state of disrepair. Uh, we're looking to see that redeveloped. Uh, we don't dictate the types of uses that would go into a tax increment finance district. Uh, we're looking for the outcome when it comes to the uh, future tax revenues, the future value, uh, future jobs, things of that nature. We're not looking for specific uh, types of businesses or land uses that would locate in that type of facility. And the, the well, actually, the the next question would be related to when we actually approve the TIF. So, so it is. It is. This is. It was found to be within our policy. Absolutely. Yes, uh, we have a number of criteria when it comes to uh, judging. I, I would say the a tax increment finance district and Mr. Burrich uh, went through a scoring process that was in the packet and this particular tax increment finance district scored very highly uh, for the criteria that we have uh, rehabilitation and the uh, jobs the uh, I don't have it off the top of my head but there's a uh, several criteria that list the, the important factors that we rate uh, for a tax increment finance district, particularly a redevelopment district. And I think the granary matches uh, a lot of those criteria. That's why it scored so so high. 
and Mr. Birch can provide you the details. Well, you know, getting back to this just being a restaurant project, uh, as Alan said, this is a blight elimination project. As part of this blight elimination project, we're going to get a rehab building out of it. So you're going to have the restaurant going to one portion of it. They're going to have the office complex in the in the main in the in the main uh, uh, mill building. That will be for a. A new, an employer is moving around the downtown area, but as part of this project, they're also expanding their workforce as part of this project. So when we start to look at things like this, and we start to connect it back to some of our plans, like the comp plan, we're, talk, we're, we're seeing things like, you know, revitalizing, th revitalizing and creating activity in the South Shore area or along the waterfront. Revitalize, revitalization of a, of a locally landmark structure. So it's a historic preservation project. So from our standpoint, from a planning standpoint, it hits, there's nothing out there in our pl any of our plans that say, redevelop the granary. We, sit, we talk about preservation of historic, important historic structures. This is, for, for us, it's an important historic structure in our downtown area because it's one of two locally landmark structures that, we, that we've actually done locally. There's only one other one in the community. So. From our standpoint, it hits the blight elimination uh, basis for the for the uh, statutory requirements. But then we look at why we're doing it. We're looking for the blight elimination, the creation of some jobs, and the creation of activity along our riverfront downtown. And, and one thing I can add uh, as a member of the Landmarks Commission, the Landmarks Commission did landmark that building well over a year ago, which would allow the developers to do things that to retain a lot of the historic character of the interior of the building. So that process uh, was put in play it was well over a year, a couple of years ago, I think. And just to follow up on the criteria, the extraordinary development and redevelopment costs for a blight elimination project, such as remodeling, rehabilitation, demolition, environmental remediation, uh, and implements a city strategic planning document, such as the comprehensive plan or the downtown plan or the Riverwalk plan, historic <coughs> preservation, uh, the overall aesthetics of the project, uh, environmental sustainability, enhancing streetscape and pedestrian experience, proposed employment potential. Uh, if you add all those up, it scores very highly in a lot of those categories. So that's why we think it's a, a worthy project for a tax increment finance district. And I'm sorry, Mr. Herman had a question. No, that's all right. Um, no, that's great. I'm glad you answered that. Um, yesterday, when we did a tour of the granary, um, you mentioned there'll be some improvements with the Riverwalk that can be incorporated into this project. Yes. Uh, you want to just kind of go over that? Because that, that's another piece of the pie that we're trying to do is get our Riverwalk completed. Yes. Uh, if you recall, we're working on the south shore of the Riverwalk, and right now we're doing most of the work in the Jolwyn Morgan District area. Right. But we expect that Riverwalk to go east to the Pioneer and the Pioneer Island area. Uh, in the short term, uh, since we can't really get through the Sweetwater Marina area, we're going to have to kind of uh, go around the perimeter, kind of like how we did at the, on the north side uh, around Mercury Marine. If you recall, we went around that particular property as well. So I see the granary as being one of those pieces uh, that goes around the perimeter that goes from uh, the water, uh, goes along Nebraska up to the corner where the, the granary is, and then across the 6th Avenue to the east all the way to Main Street, and then it'll, it'll uh, hook up again with the river. Uh, that would be a good short-term solution for the Riverwalk because Sweetwater right now, it just it isn't feasible to get the Riverwalk through that property. So they're actually proposing streetscape improvements that would widen the sidewalk, uh, put some street trees in, and, and beautify the area, as well as uh, something else they'll be coming back with is expanding the patio uh, ordinance to allow uh, the sidewalk cafes uh, to be uh, located at, at the granary. So uh, we think that would actually enhance some of the uh, river walk, I say, destinations that we need to create more of on the South Shore. Okay. And then you also mentioned yesterday about some improvements to Fifth Street and parking. Yes. Public parking? Yes. Uh, the area between the granary and Sweetwater is technically a public road, street right away, and it's in not so good a shape right now, a lot of potholes. Uh, they are proposing to make improvements uh, both on their property and the street right away uh, so that uh, we'll provide more parking for the granary area as well as any other customers to both businesses and, and the public. Uh, and they'll also take care of uh, maybe delineating the 
the location of the public right of way because a lot of people just assume it's one big parking lot where in fact it is a, a street that goes through there and they'll put some curbing in to uh, uh, delineate that public right of way. Okay. There's been some question um, about the length of the TIF. Is it 22 years? Is it 27 years? Just where, where what is the length of the TIF? Uh, the TIF is all comes down to the development agreement when it comes to that. At this point in time, the developers are asking for the PAYGO TIF, uh, which is no specific dollar amount. It's based on the uh, rate of return that they have on their investment. Uh, right now, they're in the single digits for the return on investment for the property, and you could, in theory, ask for 90% for the entire 27 years. Uh, and my expectation is that based on their rate of return, uh, that would uh, uh, could justify the award of a 90% for 27 years. When you get to those kinds of details, that's the development agreement, and of course, we'll bring a development agreement back to council for any kind of uh, review and action by the council. Okay, and I believe there's a representative from Ellers here tonight? Yes, uh, Todd uh -huh. Taves uh, put together the tax increment finance district right. plan and uh, did a lot of the cash flow analysis and uh, generated a, the rate of return so we could advise the city as to how well this particular project met our criteria and TIF uh, statutes. Right. So if you have any yeah, questions Yeah, I just want to have I'm Mr. Taves, sure as long as he came up uh, to Oshkosh, if he could just kind of do a, just a real brief analysis or whatever sure. in your report. Sure, and uh, on that last question, uh, the, the statutory life of the TIF is 27 years. Where the 22 years comes uh, from is that is based on our cash flow projections. Uh, the point in time based on the assumptions where the amount that the developer has asked for as the incentive would be retired. So in other words, the TID would be projected to close in 22 years, although it could remain open for 27. Okay. Um, I mean, just a few comments. Yep. So as part of our engagement, we were asked to look at the performance that the developers submitted. And uh, what they had indicated is that without TIP assistance, uh, they would uh, receive a return of just under 2% uh, on that investment. And with the TIP assistance, uh, it was going to be just under 5%. So we've got an uh, individual that works with us, Frank Roman, who I know has been before the council uh, in the past, who has a real estate development background. So what he does is he takes a look at the developer's numbers, uh, confirms that the math is working correctly, and then based on his experience in industry norms, looks to see if the uh, the revenues, the expenditures, the costs that they're assuming are within the range of reasonableness, and he concluded that they, they were. Uh, so then based on that, the question becomes is, is the uh, rate of return appropriate for the type of uh, project that we're looking at? And depending on the type of project, the nature of the risk associated with it, that range of return is typically somewhere in the 10 to 25% range. So in this case, even with TIF, uh, being under 5%, what that would tell us is that a an investor that's strictly motivated by a return or a profit on a project would not be likely to undertake this. So really, this is a substandard market rate return on this project, either with or without assistance. So based on that, uh, you know, we, you know, it's our opinion that the TIP assistance will make the project more profitable for the developer, but it will not bring it to a level where again, a purely profit-motivated investor would look at this as a, a worthwhile project from that standpoint. Um, so I think b beyond that, I'd certainly be happy to answer any specific questions uh, you might have with respect to the project plan, the costs, or the uh, cash flows that we've prepared. Mr. Taves, I do have one question. Uh, you know, for people you know, listening or watching, watching in Oshkosh Media, uh, explain the term PAYGO so people understand the mechanics of this type sure. of Sure. So um, when we have a, a project like this, basically what is happening is the developer is asserting that they have a gap. In other words, uh, the sources they have available uh, and then the costs of the project are not aligning. And so they need to fill that gap with a source other than their own capital in order to make the project, again, profitable uh, at an acceptable level to them. So there's two ways that we can fill that gap. One is that the city would either borrow the funds or apply funds from another source and give the monies to the developer up front, and then the city would use the tax increments as they come in to repay itself or to pay that debt service obligation. Pay as you go is sort of reversing the tables on that. 
instead of the city using the tax increment to repay its own debt, what it's doing is uh, providing that stream of increment, in this case 90% of the increment, to the developer. So the developer then is taking that uh, pledge of that future assignment of the revenue stream, they're taking that in most cases to a financial institution and they're receiving an upfront loan against that future stream of income. So that's how they fill that gap. So it's ultimately a risk shift equation if the city's borrowing the money while you can certainly uh, put certain securities <coughs> into the development agreement to protect yourself. At the end of the day, it would be the city's debt and if the project doesn't uh, happen at the levels that it was expected or there's other issues, the city's ultimately gonna be responsible for the debt repayment. This is taking that risk and putting it on the developer since the city would not be borrowing any funds or applying any of its own funds up front for the project. So if the project does... Ms. Palmieri. So could you just um, specify for the public too the difference between a developer-led PAYGO and the city-led PAYGO and how the cost related to the developer-led PAYGO can be higher? Well, if the city were to, to finance the improvements, you're going to be able to borrow at a lower cost of capital. So is that what you're getting at? When the city leads the development um, versus the developer, I'm sorry, the developer agreement with that PAYGO, whereas it may look like with a developer-led PAYGO, initially, there's not an upfront cost to the city, but over the life, there is actual higher costs relative to those financing fees and other things along the way. That's what I'm trying to ask you to explain. To, uh, when you use the PAYGO approach versus the city injecting the money up front, the deal will cost a bit more because a developer is not able to obtain capital at, at the types of rates that the city could. So again, there's a risk trade-off there. What the city is doing is accepting the fact that the TID may take longer to pay back uh, because of the developer's higher cost of financing. What you're receiving in return is the mitigation of the risk. So that's the, that's the trade-off. Um, you stated that with the TIF um, approval, they'd project about a 5% earning profit per year. Correct. Over, 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 the, over the life over of the, the, the t it's actually a 10 year analysis okay. is what's typically what percentage at. of that is the restaurant because I mean even good restaurants go to business mm -hmm. for, for variable reasons so what percentage of that is from the restaurant it's not broken down to that level of detail okay thank you and I have follow up for uh, Mr. Davis um, so half of this project is not historic in terms of the add-on building, the part that's, um, I believe, designated to be the restaurant. So when we're looking at, a, I believe it's $710,000 um, investment, uh, and that's not considered historic, you know, we're attributing some of the scoring criteria to pres for, for historic preservation. Um, help me understand how the whole project together should should get those same scoring point, points. I don't think you can separate the historic versus the non-historic is the problem. I mean, it's one big physically, project. Right. It's physically one big project, yep. and certainly looking at it, you can see there's historic pieces and right. not so historic, but you can't just build half a project or half right. a building. So uh, we came down on the side that it was uh, historic preservation from 1883 that the, the Landmarks Commission had already landmarked. Uh, we thought that justified the, the points that we gave when it came to the historic preservation and didn't try to separate that out. Uh, and when it comes to the $710,000, that's just a projection as to what the value is going to be of that uh, incremental stream in the future. Uh, I actually hope it'll be more because the value would be higher then, but that's sure. what we're expecting based on our conversations with the developer and the city assessor. Well, and um, Mr. Wiesenberg, um, you do very quality work. I've long been an admirer, and I, I think this is an excellent design project. Um, you know, this is a struggle because we're getting information from folks who are concerned about 
you know, delaying being able to realize some of the financial benefits from that. And while I realize it's been sitting empty for some time, um, looks like Plan Commission gave this about six minutes discussion in their meeting. Um, and we've just heard earlier how, um, you know, $400,000 is anticipated to be invested in Robin's restaurant. I, I don't believe they're asking us for TIF. So the question remains whether or not um, this project, while it is very uh, substantial and on people's minds, it's also in, it's right around the corner, literally, from where we just approved a TIF that was supposed to be um, spurring catalytic development. But I don't think we were anticipating that that development would be something that would also be requesting of TIFs. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'll be supporting this this evening. <clears throat> Mr. Davis, um, there's state statute that has to be um, followed in a um, TIF application. That statute's been followed correctly. So, and that came from um, Eller's information along with um, Attorney Lawrence. And so everything as far as what is required by law, which is I think it's 66, and I missed it here somewhere, um, is being covered, right? Yes. So it, it follows our TIP policy and follows state statute. Absolutely. A, a, um, yes. And falls yes. into that. I think the most significant thing is it is we're, we're saving a historic structure <clears throat> and we're eliminating blight um, in an area that's seeing new life because of the obviously the Buck Stadium but it's I mean that's been an eyesore for over a decade and uh, I think you know, I commend the developers I mean having gone through there I'm going to say two years ago with the plan on the uh, Lamar's Commission got a lot more vision than I do uh, it, it was it was pretty bad, you know, having recalled it as a, a functioning restaurant environment. Um, I think we have to look at, at the big picture of the city, of that section of the city, which is the solidest area, and uh, it just keep rehabbing, uh, uh, rebuilding that part of our city. And it's just uh, I've made the comment a lot of times that you know we're becoming a boom town again because all the things that are happening in this city. We just can't look at one structure or one building, but it's the it's the whole area. So I will be supporting this. Mayor. Yep. Um, so a so a couple of comments. Um, so first of all, ideally, um, I would love to have somebody come in, purchase the property, rehab it, um, and do it on their own dime. Um, would have loved to have heard about that within the last 10 years, um, and we haven't. Now, there's certainly opportunity with the growth that's gonna be happening on South Main Street, you know, that there is the opportunity that somebody could, if we wait, could certainly purchase it, uh, may or may not be somebody from the area. Um, and we've seen how that's worked out from time to time as well. And I think something that, that's gotten lost in this, because I agree with a lot of what Ms. Palmieri is saying, um, and when the developer's agreement comes, I'm not excited about 22 years either. Um, and I would like to have further discussion about that. But, you know, I, some of the things that I, that I heard was that the TIF was based on a restaurant. Well, that's not true. The TIF is on that area and then the building. The benefit in this project, because I was tempted to vote not in favor of this, um, but when you read our TIF policy, it says that it's specifically for, I mean, this is certainly one of the areas that, it's, that it applies to. With that being said, we have certainly had situations in which we have done this with a building and there's been no tenants. Um, they're, they're doing it on faith. Um, currently, it's my understanding and I don't have any reason to believe differently. In fact, I did have a discussion with one of um, the tenants um, today is that the benefit of this is that there's two immediate leases. They're contingent on this evening. One is for seven years, one is for 10 years. Now, it is not up to me to decide what those businesses are that go in there. Um, it, I mean, if it wasn't a restaurant, it could certainly be something else. Um, it just happens to be that one of them seems to be a restaurant. The, the, the other two factors that I look at that are encouraging is that they're both stable, businesses 
Um, well, one of them is. The other one does have people that are currently in the industry and are currently successful at what they're doing. So I find, I find that encouraging, which is better than approving a TIF in which we either don't see anything happening or we know of, of, of nothing that's going to fill it. Um, one of the things we had decided and determined that when we were going to make the investment for the taxpayer in the hotel, the downtown hotel, was that we were expecting things to, you know, um, develop around it. And we've seen that. And again, I would love to have um, the perfect situation where somebody comes in and um, are willing to do everything. Want to miss Palmieri's point with the location of Robbins, that's right off of Highway 41. Easy access. Um, and yes, they're investing for 400,000 in it. But when you look at, and I, and I believe the number, and maybe perhaps somebody here can articulate it better than I, but um, I'm, my understanding is that is well over a million dollar improvement to the building. Yes, I believe it's 1.7. Okay, I thought it was 1.2, so 1.7 million into the, into the. 1.2 is closer. Okay. You are correct. Okay. Um, so those are, those are the thoughts. Uh, because, you know, on paper, I'm skeptical, but when you take a look at what's behind it, there is substance. Um, so for that, um, and certainly I've, and that was through various conversations that I've had within the last 24 hours. And we will be bringing back the development agreement, and as we have with uh, the PAYGOs in their most recent history. Uh, we also have a look back clause at the 10 year mark to see how they're doing. Uh, if they're exceeding uh, a certain percentage, then we actually would ratchet back the, ta the tax increment finance assistance. Uh, I hope we have that type of problem. As Ms. Palmieri has suggested, we're expecting the, the South Shore to, to, to see an appreciation in values. Uh, so I'd like to see those in, uh, rate of returns increase to the point where we don't have to uh, participate nearly as much as we have in the past, but it's hard for me to predict what it will be in 10 years when the, the uh, look back provision is, is triggered. A follow up here, Mayor. Yes. So we also have uh, the but for test that we apply and we've seen time and time again and you know, I voted for the, the last uh, TIF regarding the arena and that on the basis that, you know, opportunity or that development would not occur over that life were we not using TIF assistance. So what we see coming forward in the applications is we can't get, you know, our profit margin or our internal rate of return up to the level we want, so therefore um, we need this assistance. But I think we have to look at this in a different way, that over 22 years, nothing would happen in that location short of us doing this. And I'm just not convinced of that. I would throw in, what about the past 10 years? That location has sat idle for 10 years, correct? That's my understanding, yes. yes. And is the gentlelady willing to make a bet that it could possibly be another 20 years before something comes on? I think all of us are very good stewards of the taxpayer dollars, but um, <clears throat> this is, the developers are people that, these are not people that are coming in from, they're not carpetbaggers. These are people who are invested in our community and that have seen have seen what this is, they have already put money into this project and they want to see this project going forward. Is there, will there be development related to what is going on on South Main Street? I'm sure there will be. But how long do we sit and wait to do this? And I agree with Ms. Allison Osby about that there, that this project, that there are leases ready to be signed and contingent upon completing this project. So, you know, um, I support this because this has, this project has, this 
particular property has sat idle for 10 years, yes, you could make the argument someone may come forward in the next year, maybe not. Could be five years, could be 10 years. In that time, this particular property will deteriorate more, become more of an eyesore. It may get to the point where someone looks at it and says, it's not even worth rehabilitating, and we would lose a historical structure. And there are people on this council that, that make, that talk about securing our history and, and, and making sure that we rehabilitate things and that we revitalize our neighborhoods and that we rebuild and improve what is there and this is an opportunity to put that ethos into play. So I do support this because I'm not willing to wait another three, four, five, ten, possibly twenty years from twenty years and then have this just totally disappear. There's another consideration too. The city has had to purchase another a number of structures some homes in the central city that were amongst the oldest in this community that were historically important, they'd become rentals. They were so beyond repair. We had, the city had to buy them. We had to pay to level them, and we're sitting with two empty lots that will sit empty forever. The same thing happens to a structure. Even though it's a stone structure, once deterioration happens, it accelerates, and at some point, People will be asking us, what can you do with that eyesore on 6th Street? Which means at some point, we'll wind up more than likely buying it, demoing it, and have, having lost a part of our history. Uh, so I think there, there's more than just dollars and cents to this. It's the long-term vision of the city. It's the redevelopment of, of a significant portion of this city. And I, I think we can't look at it one building at a time. We have to look at the entire the entire area and what it what it can be what it is becoming so there's just more than I think dollars and cents of this whole thing so as I said before I will support this and off of that um, I guess I look at the benefits of, of the Riverwalk uh, addition that wouldn't be happening at a very minimal cost mm -hmm. if this project doesn't go forward um, as it's been said uh, the developers on this project have been invested in Oshkosh for a long time they continue to invest in Oshkosh. They live in the Oshkosh area. They, um, you know, it, it isn't that outside developer, which we've had issues over the years, not since I've been on council, but, and I think with the Pago TIF, we are protecting ourselves with the development agreement. We have another level of protection. Um, we've met state statute, uh, 66, um, I missed it again, but we're, we're covered, and I think that with, that, with all the other comments too, um, you know, the age of the building, um, there was a lot of mold issues. It's been vacant for 10 years. It's, it's, um, it, it does pass both um, through the um, Ellers report and through uh, <coughs> the city attorney's report. It has met the but for test. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great project to, to again get something moving. I mean, uh, we approved the TIF for the beach building. The beach building's already full. It's got tenants. It's got things going on. Here, as Ms. Allison Osby mentioned, we have tenants ready to go if we move forward. So it isn't like we're approving a TIF and it's just going to sit there. And so there's action being done. So um, I, too, will support it. May I just ask for one yeah. clarification? Um, neither tenant has a investment in the property, correct? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll defer to the applicant. Chet Wiesenberg, 240 Algoma Boulevard. Um, I am a minority partner in the restaurant portion as well. So um, I can add to that. It was, it's, um, I became a partner in the real estate because I've been working on it for a year to 18 months and um, needed to invest my sweat equity to make the deal happen 
And that same thing came around to the restaurant, where the restaurant portion asked for additional investment to help make the project happen. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, so you may know the numbers better than other people. What percentage of that 5% is the restaurant projected earnings? Because, I mean, like I've said before, good restaurants fail all the time, and then your margins are nothing. Um, I think it's about 40% restaurant, 60% office. Okay. That's Rough it. numbers. Thank you. Can I just ask a few questions of the developers? Um, how long have you been working on this project? You just said a year, 18 months? Um, well, I've personally been working on it a little over 18 months. So, and you came forward with the TIF. Um, I see the market analysis was done April of 2017. Why wouldn't you come forward in the very beginning with the option for a TIF instead of starting the project and then presenting a TIF? Well, <laughs> often as an architect, you get, you get brought into projects and you work on them on the, on the come. You know, where you're, the, the deal's not there yet, but they ask you to get involved, see if you can in, in design something. Uh, I, we bid it out, came back, and the numbers weren't working. So the project was about to be uh, tabled. And that's my next question. If this does not go forward, what is your plan B for this particular area? Um, the project, if, if the TIF is not approved, the tenants back out and we start over. But that's your, your same goal then would be to rehab the building and get tenants in there for the restaurant and for the office space. That would be, that would be a goal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chet, who, who is the major owner of the property? Andy Dumkey and Cale Schultz. In which, um, and I and I did ask for permission. Um, I did have a lengthy conversation with Mr. Dumpke um, this morning, um, and he did indicate um, that certainly when they looked at the rate of return um, and based on the investment, um, that he he was looking to sell the property. Um, and it's to my understanding that you came forward, um, as well as another uh, local gentleman, to say we'd really like to keep ownership here in town um, and so Mr. Dumpke said he then reconsidered. Um, he said when he looked at it, a project of this magnitude, you know, typically if you were to kind of take the building and, you know, and I don't know the, I don't remember from, from our conversation the square footage, but if you were to build new, it would cost about 125,000, you know, per, per unit. Um, when you're rehabbing a project like this, you're running more in the neighborhood of 180 to 190,000. And um, and I and I asked Andy, why why would you do this? Um, I mean, looking at a rate of return of two percent or even five percent. I mean, when really from a business standpoint, you would want to have higher. Um, you know, it's because it's in in your own backyard, is what he said about himself and about and about you. So, you know, that's where I go back and say, ideally, I would love for you guys to fund the project out of your own pocket. Find your own financing, not depend on us for TIFs, so on and so forth, but we haven't had anybody else come forward in over a decade. So then I look at, well, you know, what's the other option? And with Mr. Dumpke, he certainly could sell it, and it could go to somebody outside of the area, not that I ever want to discourage somebody from outside of our area to come in, and to develop and, and we will see that as we're, we're moving forward um, but that was just some of some of the information as well as he had discussed um, piping leading up to the building um, and the disrepair there that's underground um, and and that's that's all things that are going to have to be dealt with for anybody that looks to develop that property yes Ms. Pelmer it was just Kind of one last comment here and that is that when we talk about looking at the big picture I think that TIF has been a really um, we'll, we'll be exploring this policy further as Mr. Davis has suggested we've got some tweaking to do it's been a really useful tool during times when things were very challenging we're starting to see some benefits from utilizing that tool. And we're going to be seeing more TIF applications coming forward imminently, of which I believe it 
could potentially be Mr. Dumpke on the Pioneer property, you know, or any number of other scenarios. Um, I guess I feel like we, if we're successful in what we're attempting to do in the, in the South Shore redevelopment area, you know, we should be generating, um, if not direct out-of-pocket investment, shorter, smaller TIF life um, investment from the city side of this. And, that, and that's really all I had to add. <clears throat> I just want to make one comment, and that's that I appreciate the hard questions. I really do. But I think I just want to reiterate what Todd from Miller said, is that a typical project like this, people that are purely financially motivated are looking for 20 to 25% mm -hmm. returns. And the fact that we're looking at a 5% return, I think, should speak volumes to everybody on this council. It's heard. Okay, if there are no further questions on resolution 17 271, would you please take the roll? Pat? Aye. <coughs> Paul Mary? No. Allison Osby? Aye. Herman? Aye. Pansky? No. Rosie? No. Uh, Cummings? Aye. Carried 4 3. Resolution 17-272, approve specific implementation <coughs> plan for plan development of 50 West 6th Avenue and parking lot east of 40 West 6th Avenue. The Granary Plan Commission recommends approval. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this resolution? <coughs> I see no one coming forward. Turn back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Davis, you want to just kind of go over what what this has to do with uh, 50 West 6th, the uh, plan for development there? Yes, this is the physical improvements at the greenery that we talked about as part of the TIF. Mm -hmm. uh, so the plan commission needs to take a look at this as the specific implementation of this site. You could see where the uh, sidewalk improvements and the street improvements were being proposed, uh, which the developer is paying for up front. Uh, and the total project cost, I think the value is what I had in mind when I was mm -hmm. talking earlier. It, it comes in, uh, I think the assessor is estimating it to be somewhere around $1.6 or $1.7 million of value. Uh, so the, the, the upshot is the, uh, the proposed TIF would actually make the specific implementation plan possible. Okay, and then there's also a parking lot involved in this? Yes, uh, that would be Kitty Corner uh, okay. to the southwest of Nebraska and 6th. Uh, that the RDA currently owns. That's another pro pro blighted property that we acquired and demolished. Uh, they're looking to create a parking lot to serve uh, the employees and customers of the greenery. Okay. If I remember right, I think that property was a, a bar or a tavern or something like that, dance place. Years yes. back in the 70s. Judy Gin Mill. The Sample House. What? Sample yeah. House, that's it. That's the one, I remember that. I'm older. But Okay, so, so that, that incorporates that uh, the RDA would then sell that lot? Yes, to? they would. Okay. And then they're going to develop that parking lot there and some of the other improvements on the exterior. Yes, the RDA already granted an option depending on how everything turns out here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Uh, there was an issue according to the minutes here for um, a Mr. Kepler. Yes. Are you familiar with that and has that yes. been resolved? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kepler... Uh, once it was explained that it would be an easement to the city, I think he was fine with the, the easement requirement. At least he was at the end of the planning commission meeting. Okay, so he, he, okay, thank you. Is there any further questions, of Mr. Davis? I see none, would you please take the roll? Pack. Aye. Paul Mary? No. Allison Osby? Aye. Herman? Aye. Pansky? No. Krause? No. Cummings? Aye. Carried 4 3. Resolution 17 273 support Go Transit's application for section 5339 in parens C close parens grant program funding 
for an electric bus replacement project. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak to this item? I see no one coming forward. Bring back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Um, I have a question for Mr. Collins. Unfortunately, while playing golf at Lakeshore the other day, I saw one of our buses being told by Nolte's and it was one of our electric buses. <laughs> so what are the odds that our electric buses are actually saving us money? Well, that was a, this is, that's actually a hybrid. So we have 10 diesel buses and we have four, well, we have 12, 10 2003 diesels. We have four 2010 hybrids and two <laughs> 2013 um, diesel buses. But anyway, that was one, it, it's a good question. We actually, it's, with the newer technology that burns the particulates to make sure the exhaust is cleaner, um, the filter in that one actually got plugged, so that caused we have to go and get the filter clean. But anyway, that was kind of an isolated incident for that okay. bus. But um, we also had one of our 2003s where the mortar just failed. So we were awarded grants over the last couple of years to, to buy some replacement buses. The ones we're currently buying are diesel. What this is is we're applying for a grant for an electric Bus. There's some discretionary grant funding available. There's only like 55 million nationwide, but um, we'll put in our application for it. The electric buses are different than the hybrids, as you know, the hybrids are run both on diesel and battery power, and it kind of um, it varies based on the operation. Whereas this would be 100% electric. These are kind of in their infancy, um, so this is the trend where we're. The, bus, the transit industry is currently going to. We'd be the first system in Wisconsin that would get one, but uh, as far as the maintenance, because it's it wouldn't be a hybrid, you wouldn't have the issues that we just had on that one. Okay. So this would be 100% electric. We don't think our chances are very good of winning it, but we're at least going to throw our hand. Sure. If you, don't, if you don't ask, you don't ever get. And so the um, there's a local match to it also. Yeah, there would be a 20% local match, which is in will be in the CIP. And that's 168,000 is our match, right? So these currently a diesel bus is around 450,000. The hybrids um, depends when we would order it. They go down every year, but they're between seven and 800,000. But it's 80-20. So if we get the grant, it would pay for 80 percent, and then we'd have to come okay. with 20 percent local. So if we would get one, we'd probably buy, you know, one electric instead of two diesel with the local funds. Or and something. we have staff that's capable of working with total electric buses and things like that so that uh, yeah I mean our mechanics are very skilled they've worked on the hybrids I've, they haven't worked on 100% electric but they know enough about it they're up on okay. all the industry standards so. okay. <clears throat> all right thank you any further questions would you please take the roll pack aye Paul Mary aye Allison Osby aye Herman aye Pansky aye Krause aye Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Now we're at council discussion, direction to city manager and future agenda items. The first is a meeting <laughs> with local legislatures, state representatives to be determined. It, it really is going to remain to be determined at this time. June is a big month for the legislators to work on the final parts of the budget. Availability is sketchy and each one is unavailable at one time or the other. So. Uh, I'm going to suggest to council that we push it into July and just see uh, if they get the budget adopted before July 1, perhaps July would be a good month to do it, but June doesn't look good right now. Okay. Uh, next we have workshop on boards and commissions study. Uh, as the mayor knows, I uh, had a, a brief uh, discussion with the chairs of the different boards and commissions, uh, gave them a little uh, feel for uh, where I was going with the study uh, the council directed me to do. Um, Ms. Lawrenson has been doing some research. Other staff have been doing research from other communities, getting some input on those, getting some input from our own departments about the frequency with which meetings are canceled and things like that. And that all come into, into play with the study. I think we can, uh, if, if you want to, we can schedule a workshop for June 13th. Uh, I'm probably going to get the report to you. Uh, probably about five days before June 13th. I could do that. 
Otherwise, we can move until June 27th, but I'll, I'll follow whatever lead council wants to make on this one. I would prefer you to do it on the 13th, and we'll then out a closed session on the 27th. Okay. How long were you thinking the workshop? Because with this complete streets workshop as well, that keeps me until 5. Uh, I don't have anything scheduled for a complete streets workshop. That gentleman requested that. Uh, right, but council has to give me direction on what you want to do. I'm just wondering personally. I will be attending this workshop for complete streets. Oh, so that keeps me unavailable until five. So I'm wondering how much time you need. Probably five. I don't think we're going to need more than the 45 minutes. Uh, if we start at five, I think we get it. I'm going to. The idea is give it to you in advance because the presentation, if you have that in advance there's not going to be much of a presentation necessary uh, a lot of it is just compiling what we already have I think it'll be interesting to look at some of the the research so you get a feel for it uh, but in terms of the recommendations I'm not necessarily expecting council to embrace every recommendation it's really more here's a uh, a menu of items that you could do um, I don't believe that you'll want to take any action because some of these things may be a little more controversial but I think that's what the council wanted me to do to give you some food for thought so uh, you read it we'll talk about it a little bit at the workshop and then uh, probably the 27th we'll just say okay where do we want to go with this next so that, that's how I envision this going uh, once I make the presentation to council I think this whole this whole thing stemmed out of my frustration as mayor trying to find people to serve on our numerous boards and commissions and one goal we have I think collectively is uh, we want to make our boards and commissions more reflective of the diversity in this community uh, so as we go through you know do we consolidate what do we do with these boards and commissions that is one of the ultimate goals is uh, a reflection of our community and this was one of the directions we gave the city manager at the time of his correct. review the end of last year correct yeah. And we've also had, you know, citizens question purposes and, um, you know, whether or not we're operating efficiently, if we're having a hard time filling this. So this is absolutely, I think, looking looking forward to seeing what some of those creative opportunities are. And I think our citizens will be pleased to see some something other than the norm. I also had um, heard from council the number of the liaisons and the the purpose of the council liaison and what we could do with that as well so that, that was another thing I heard from the council um, one thing I will you know tease you with in terms of information as much as I originally looked at the information about the number of boards and commissions we have about 26 boards and commissions um, we're on the high side but we are not alone on the high side yeah. several of our uh, and I, I looked at council manager cities I felt that was the best approach um, there are some with upwards of 20 and uh, I heard a, a couple of my colleagues commented to me I didn't realize how many boards and commissions I had until you asked me mark so it it grows we are not alone we are in the same boat as so many of other colleagues and that'll be that'll be food for thought but do we have identical boards and commissions no we don't with it which is really interesting that depends on each community's own choices and uh, That'll, that'll be what it's all about is what what you want to do with all the choices you have before you the so, names are only different I'm all yeah names are names are names are changed but it, the, the goal is the same and it's citizen engagement right. and I think that is clearly what council is has wanted to do is, is to get more citizen engagement um, but you have a lot of boards and commissions we have about 26 you, you've got a lot in your hands but I'm not going to tease you anymore that you'll have to wait and uh, but the idea will be get it to you around uh, the eighth or ninth. Okay. Speaking of citizen involvement, now is the time, second time for citizens to address the city council. Citizen statements are limited to five minutes. Must address items that are not listed on the council meeting agenda. Are limited to issues that have an impact on the city of Oshkosh, and the common council may address at a future meeting, and must not include endorsements of any candidates or other electioneering. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address the public and the council? I see no one coming forward. Uh, I will turn it over to the city, city manager Roloff for announcements and statements. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Davis has provided the update uh, most recent about the arena. Uh, some construction work began. The arena got their state approval on their uh, revised building plans. And so uh, there's a lot of steel over there, and it's going up uh, this week, and we're happy to report that. Uh, as a follow-up to the last council meeting, item 34 is we've uh, enlisted the services of AECOM uh, at a cost of 70000 to work on that site development work associated with the State Street parking lot. So that's going to be taken care of. Uh, and then lastly, my report uh, is regarding uh, Bates soil and water testing. As I reported to council, uh, Bates has started uh, the wetland delineation to gather information on uh, the condition of the Lakeshore Golf Course, and uh, that's really all I have to report it right now. They'll be uh, probably there for a few more days with engineers out there as well. Just a question on that. Um, I had a couple of people contact me, and they wanted to know why we were doing that in the middle of golf season and why we were even doing it at all. So maybe you can just speak to that. By law, you cannot begin. I shouldn't say by law, but it, in order to do an appropriate wetland delineation. You have to wait for a certain time of year, and that time of year is after uh, the winter and, and winter uh, melt off has occurred. Uh, that enables uh, the uh, consultant who is certified by the DNR to conduct that. So really, it's about this time of year. Typically, wetland delineations start. Uh, if you're very lucky, April. If you're lucky, May, and maybe even into June before they can start, and then they have to be completed by year end. <laughs> so that's uh, Thank you. this was not this is not an item for for council discussion this is a report from from me so that's, that's all I have did, I, did you have another question though uh, no the question from uh, the citizen that originally emailed me was also not only why they were doing it now but why they were doing it why we were doing it at all uh, we've had questions periodically about Lakeshore Municipal Golf Course and so I directed staff to do this analysis uh, we've had inquiries over the year, over the years, and we've been unable to answer questions about the site. Uh, that doesn't mean that the site's for sale, but that just means that we have information that we can now have. Uh, we did that very similarly with the uh, uh, the Buckstaff property, and the timing went very well. We had information available, and Greater Oshkosh EDC was able to take that information, and uh, we felt it was appropriate now that. We have inquiries uh, more than uh, you know. More than you know, I've I've had handful of inquiries over the years, and it's just not being able to have that information uh, puts us at a disadvantage when we're uh, when we're looking to provide information to prospective uh, developers. Okay. I see someone at the podium. You you missed citizen statements, but he can. Yes, we'll, we'll give him room. Go ahead. Since this was technically on the agenda, I wasn't sure if I'd wait until now. Um, but I think I might be one of the people that Ms. Palmieri is referencing. Do we need, need your name and address? My name is Brett Spangler, and I live at 2520 Hearthstone Drive. Um, I guess I'd like to start off thanking Council Members Herman and Peck for their longstanding dedication to Lakeshore Golf Course and their support for it over the years. And I would just like to say I hope that continues. And I would like to thank all of you for allowing me to speak tonight. I know it's the last time on the agenda and we all want to get out of here, but I just have a couple things I'd like to say. The potential sale of Lakeshore Golf Course to me, even though nothing is official, to any private company is incredibly frustrating. One reason is the pace that this project is moving along. I may be wrong and I'm not necessarily up to date on what land delineation process is. But because of how fast it's, it's moving, it just feels a little suspicious. In addition, the comments made by many of you, including Mr. Olaf just yesterday to one of my colleagues, indicate that the decision to sell has already been made, no matter what happens or what the public thinks on this issue. This urgency shows me that deep down, even you folks know that it might not be the best idea or that not many, of the people, are, not many people in the public are going to support it. Moving forward, Oshkosh Corporation who is the rumored buyer, even though nothing's official, is a Fortune 500 company with, with assets totaling $4.51 billion. And I understand the immense benefits that Oshkosh Corp has brought to this area. And I think that we should be able to find them another piece of land. 
land that isn't on beautiful public property that just so happens to be in a flood zone. This action sets an enormously dangerous precedent of selling public land to private companies. Where does it end? Menominee Park? The zoo? This isn't just about the golf course. This is about public land that belongs to everyone. The golf course is the direct equivalent of Menominee Park, South Park, Pollock Pool, or any other public recreational space, yet it appears as though it is treated as another entity entirely. Additionally, there is so much undeveloped land available on the south and east sides of the city, some of which is near the old Buckstaff building, which stood vacant and unbought for five years, I might add. There's simply no logical reason to jump straight into offering up a public stretch on the lakefront that thousands of people use every single year. Furthermore, I believe this entire situation could have been avoided. For example, this official press release from the city is this time. Yep, they'll come on. States that the five new Welcome to Oshkosh signs came in at $93,000 each, totaling $465,000. This project costed more than the alleged debt held by the golf course. The Talking Root Project, who, make, who helped make the signs possible, part of the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation, is dedicated to, quote, beautifying our city and neighborhoods, and future donations will support tree planting, landscaping, and beautification projects in Oshkosh, end quote. If someone on the council or the city manager's office would have sat down with the leader of the fund and explained that the golf course and parks were in trouble, I'm sure the fund would be more than happy to help since those definitely beautify the city more than a corporate office building, concrete parking lot, and sea of military vehicles. We could have gotten rid of the debt and kept our beautiful green space. Along those same lines, I was recently made aware of the extensive renovations being made at South Park. The only way this, that South Park makes money is if people actually reserve the shelters. There's no way we're not losing money on the redevelopment project, or from year to year for that matter. This is just another example where the golf course is, is treated like the black sheep or the outsider. Additionally, the skate park was funded by the city, but it makes no revenue, and a lot fewer people use the skate park than they do the golf course. But how much was spent on that redevelopment project? In addition, golf courses can be run profitably. This excerpt from the 2017 Adopted budget and service plan from the city of Appleton shows that Reed Municipal Golf Course, the course run by the city, has made money every year since 2014, which is as far back as the budget shows. And the total net revenue equals $216,481. So I'd like to take a second and ask ourselves, have I done everything I can to make the course profitable? Have I talked to Appleton city leaders? Have I done anything to help the course? Or have I seen that the course has debt and just want to get rid of it to the first potential buyer? The so-called event city should be able to run a profitable golf course. Reed Golf Course clearly shows that a city-run course can be profitable if it is operated and managed in the correct fashion by the city's leaders, something that I do not believe has been done here. Lastly, I don't want to sound like the stereotypical environmentalist, but all the wildlife that calls the course home should be noted, especially since they can't speak for themselves. I have personally seen raccoons, foxes, cranes, egrets, pelicans, squirrels, chipmunks, geese, ducks, muskrats, turtles, and a countless number of other birds on the course. We're already losing an alarming rate of species to extinction each day from urbanization projects just like this one. So why do we have to add on to that here in Oshkosh? Now I do apologize for taking a somewhat confrontational tone and sounding like Sean Spicer at a press briefing, but if you've been following this on social media, nobody can understand why this would be an option. It's not like the people at Oshkosh Corp are gonna be laid off if they don't get this land. They just simply have shown interest in it, and it appears that some of the city leaders have been more than willing to give it up. The response to my social media posts and letter to the editor has been incredibly one-sided in favor of not selling. Even people who don't golf agree that this shouldn't be allowed to happen. And I just want to say that, um, you know, it's just, it's a little frustrating that it appears that some of our leaders have lost touch with those who voted for them. And just, we don't feel like we're being heard 100%. So I'd just like you to take uh, into account our, the public's feelings on this. And I hope that our message is finally heard. Uh, once again, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. Yep. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. I would look for a 
motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Adjourned. Aye. Aye.